now I think uh, we can move on to the Q and A session. Uh, there are a couple of questions already on the list. Uh, I'll just go uh, one by one. Um, the first question is uh, to Maria from David. Um, David is um, commenting that the, the the work is really fascinating and exciting, and if um, so, he's basically commenting on uh, on the image uh, uh, the the machine learning trained on the set of images. Can it be um, uh, and those images can be very sensitive to particular optical conditions such as prop conditions, detector and Aperture setups. Um, so, do you can you transfer those um, like learnings from like images that are collected from different instruments or different methods, uh, or should there be any? Um, uh, do we need to envision new ways to conceptualize the parameter space? He's asking. It's it's very difficult. Um, uh, I mean, so this is the thing that we find over and over um, uh, computer vision neural networks that are trained on cats and dogs and cars and trees um, actually it does not do poorly on uh, microscopy images, but improving it, it it's um, not always straightforward. So, um, you know, when you think of the similarity of images, uh, microscopy images that come from different equipment, um, and we're more familiar with electron microscopy and scanning probe microscopy. We don't usually work on optical microscopy, um, but um, you know the 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 story is the same. Um, the difference between uh, different, say, noise levels and electron microscope uh, images from different instruments, it's much smaller than the difference between electron microscopy image and the image of a cat, right? Um, so um, you know it is definitely doable um, um, to to treat different noise levels from different microscopy images um, within the same type of models. Um, but, you know, it, as I propose to this, this session, the key isn't um, the model, the key is the data. I think yesterday um, um, there were some really amazing comments about, you know, data is the engine. Um, so we have a lot of microscopy data, like terabytes levels of microscopy data, but they're all unlabeled. Um, so, you know, that is, the, I think that is the bottleneck right now, not which model and how we can tune the, um, you know, uh, parameter space of different um, acquisitions. Yeah, thank you, Maria. I, I agree. I think like, you know, if you, like, uh, if you go to any academic institution, any research institution, if you go to their STM lab, I'm sure they have like, uh, like years of microscopy data that is stored from different different materials, but how to how to make it useful now is is still a big challenge, right? Yeah. Like it's um, I think that's 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 really key. Yeah. yeah. But what you say is like if you the the images that you collected from the from the papers, you can still build the models upon them, and it's it's, it's working. Yes. Yes, the, the papers uh, lose a lot, right? Because turning the image into a, a publishable paper, uh, uh, like a usual image, it just changes the dynamic range of the microscopy uh, data completely. Um, and you lose a lot, but you know what you gain is the description and a very in-depth detailed description. You know, people like Anubhav and others have um, worked a lot on um, the text mining part of it, um, um, which, you know, I think, I think it's, it's really, um, very helpful. And then we have used the labeled images and, and worked on uh, retrieval problems, for example. Um, and it, it, it actually works reasonably well. Um, but, you know, I think going forward, it would be great to really have um, infrastructure that allow people to label um, and incentivize people to label the data um, that, uh, you know, as they are being acquired. Thank you. Um, uh, a question to um, Anubal, um by by Suin, um, saying uh, the question is like the screening based on citation skews the results to older papers necessarily. Is it possible that there are shifts in trends with respect to database or methods that are based on new newer papers? Uh, 
I think it's more a comment on. Um... Yeah, I mean, certainly there will be some shift because some of the methods weren't developed until a couple of years ago. And so obviously, you know, they would be cited recently, but not before that. Um, I was looking a little bit for some of these shifts, but it was hard to find because um, the, the the rate of increase of the papers in machine learning overall is kind of exponential. So there's about 67% more papers every year uh, in machine learning in this topic than there is the previous year. So the data is like heavily skewed towards the last couple, the last two years is like more than half the data overall because of this like exponential shift. Um, and so there's definitely been these shifts, but they've been a little bit hard to detect in the data. Uh, but certainly we would expect things like deep learning to take a little bit higher role. And, uh, you know, I was mentioning that these crystal graph neural networks for property prediction have become extremely popular. And so that's been a major shift um, since the development of those uh, four or five years ago. So, uh, you know, it's been difficult to see, I think, just because it, this is like a field where there's been almost no papers in like 2013. And now by like 2023, there is, you know, thousands and thousands of papers. So everything is very skewed towards the, the last couple of years. Yeah, okay, that's true. Um, the next question from Matt Evans and David uh, to Mohamed. Uh, so they are going like uh, opposite to, to your idea of centralizing the, the databases, but instead the question is, uh, instead of centralizing ab initio data sets, how can we effectively decentralize all these efforts to aggregate our ab initio data sets? Um, what do you say? I, I'm guessing the question is, it, I, I took a look at the paper they, they posted. It sounds like that's already the effort I'm trying to talk about. Like they are kind of centralizing everything there. I think maybe the comment is not doing something new to centralize, cent centralize a new effort, but maybe that effort. And I think like I would have no qualms with that. Like I think that I just, took a skim, uh, a brief look at it. And like, like, that looks exactly like what I had have in mind. And I think, I think the last comment of the, it relies a lot of volunteer time and goodwill. And I think that's the trickiest part in the community, just because like, if we want all people on board, like, I don't know, like, it feels like there needs to be what, whatever effort that people converge on or people find is great. Like whether it be um, Optimate or whatever other initiatives, like it feels like there needs to be like a talking tour where people are going around talking about this to get other people excited and on board. Like I wasn't familiar with this. This is just coming to my attention for the first time. Um, it does look fairly new. So that's part of it. Um, but I think that's going to be uh, the biggest selling point where we need other people to get excited about it rather than just um, like the papers out there and we're not actively kind of getting people drawn in. Like as far as getting our data sets on, on there, like there would be no issues with that. And like, that's exactly on the right direction of um, kind of putting it all in one place or making it easily, or having at least an API to, to know where to pull data from. Um, so yeah, I'm all, I'm all for this. I think it's just, it is really tricky to get other people excited. Like, especially when it requires depend, like, I don't know, we, we worked with materials project to kind of put some of OC20 onto MP, MP contribs. Um, and that did require a lot of effort. So like, if some teams don't have the bandwidth to do that, like, how does that work? Does, like, does Optimate have funding to kind of proactively work with other teams to get data on that? Because if it often relies just on external folks, there's probably going to be less incentive, or just maybe less bandwidth to actively, actively do that. Okay, thank you. Um, one uh, question to Tang Fei. Uh, so the comment is like, um, the, some of the research that you do is using Polyin for database and, um, but uh, the data is not public. Um, yeah, what that's, do you think that's like, a, that's a, yeah. I think it's a very important like, uh, uh, question it is to everyone, extremely I think important. Some, some of the data is not that it is yeah. public and yeah. 
in terms of reproducibility, in terms of like people who wants to uh, do something similar or get more insights is always, a, I think, a challenge. So what are your comments? That's true. I mean, everyone, I think. Right. Man, yeah, many years ago, we started to do uh, polymer informatics or uh, thermal conductivity. Um, and polyinfo was really the only data uh, base that we can grab data from. Otherwise, we'll have to go to the literature to read hundreds of uh, papers. So, and then I had a very diligent student go to uh, Polinfo and then like manually search the uh, um, uh, polymer structure and then look up the number and then put on the Excel sheet. Um, like tens per day and over a few months, we got enough data so that we can do something. Even after that, um, well, after we publish a paper, people ask us for the data. We cannot share. Uh, we simply cannot share it according to the fine prints of uh, the websites. So what we end up doing is we use that polymer structures we collected, um, and then we learn the syntax of the chemistry. And then we generate a, a synthetic database. And, and that turns out to be pretty popular. Um, so they're all, uh, uh, sorry, uh, hypothetical uh, uh, data, uh, polymer data. Uh, that At least it's a playground for people to like test their machine learning algorithm. Um, we're planning to say, put more labels to these uh, data. Um, so at least something is better than nothing, uh, I would say. Yeah, I, I would love Polymer Society to have something like Matura's project. Okay, thank you. Uh, one question to uh, another, another question to Maria uh, from David. Uh, about the plot of spectra. Um, so uh, he's commenting a lot of data is encoded in plots that already exist. But how does plot to spectra compare with having the underlying tabular data directly to envision plot to spectra being sidelined in the future if people share the data directly? So I have a funny story to tell uh, about plot to spectra. When um, we submitted it to Digital Discovery, and um, one of the reviewer comments was, why is this necessary? Why isn't the data already available from papers um, in digital form? And, you know, I, I was, I did not write that, but I was very tempted to write, you know, I wasn't there 50 years ago when this was, or maybe a hundred years ago when this was decided. Um, so yes, we would love for plot to spectra to no longer be necessary because everyone upload all their data. Um, of course, tables have far fewer numbers, right? You know, you show a plot when you have, let's say, fifty or a hundred points in X and Y. Um, so, so they they would definitely plots definitely have different data and and somewhat like bigger, slightly bigger data than tables. Um, and we would love for that to just be automatically available. Um, you know that people will be required to upload um, a CSV file for the plots that is in their paper. Um, you know, from the Nelson Memorandum, um, this is supposed to be a requirement in 2025, right? Um, the, the data in all publication is supposed to, or federally funded publication um, should be made available. Um, whether this is going to happen and how and so on is still a, a, up in the air. Um, and 2025 seems much closer than <laughs> um, it was when this memorandum came out. So. Um, I, you know, I, I think all of this um, work can be just a temporary thing. Um, you know, we have this huge number of papers that was published in mostly the past, you know, maybe 30, 50 years that had a lot of data in it that, you know, you sort of have to be an archaeologist um, to, to, to get access to it. But, you know, it's our idea wish that going forward, all of this will be unnecessary. Microscopy data would be you know, gathered um, as they are acquired um, and, and labeled and made available um, and same as, you know, spectroscopy type data. Okay, thank you. And one, one question to Mohamed. Um, 
what is preventing more involvement from industry to efforts like open catalyst? What can Meta do to do to influence their peers to invest more in materials informatics? Yeah, uh, I guess a quick comment here. I mean, like, I think the the past few years has been uh, seen a significant shift with industry and like materials informatics. Like, I many of you have probably seen Microsoft Research. There's a, a lot of work coming out of there. You've seen Google DeepMind. A lot of work coming out of there. Like, I would actually argue that like we're already seeing a lot more involvement from industry in the material informatics space. Um, and these are like from big tech labs that have nothing to do with like materials discovery and like it's purely a research problem. Um, there may be other incentives and, and whatnot, but like I, I would like to think that we are in that direction of other people are getting excited about it. They are recognizing that there is a shift. There is like a, the way Alpha fold and the protein shift had over the past decades, like that moment is either coming up or happening. We're in that process. Like I do truly feel like that's where we currently are. Um, one thing I do want to comment on that, like does feel to be different across industry is just accessibility. Like um, what we're doing at open catalyst and what we're doing at meta is very just our philosophy is all open. So anything we do, any data we put out is public, is open um, for the community. Um, that isn't necessarily the case with kind of other industry people also in this space. Like, I mean, everyone's here in material research. Like we've all seen uh, a lot of the discussions going on that some data not being public from coming out of these industry labs. I mean, I think that's one challenge that we hope industry will kind of maybe just start to be more open about it. Like. A lot of the data is exciting. A lot of the data is super useful to the community um, and being more open with that is something that we hope to see kind of that paradigm shift over the coming years. But at the end of the day, these are industry and like there are lawyers behind the scenes that are probably, re I'm sure the researchers all want things open and they all mean well. I think there's other influences beyond researcher um, kind of uh, intuition. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of my current stance. Yeah, I mean, I can second that. I'm as a, as a person from industry. Uh, yeah, we uh, uh, definitely certain like IP legal considerations while sharing data with outside. So there's uh, some other other challenges over there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we can certainly blame lawyers because there are no lawyers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And one question from David to all the panelists here, uh, but more like an open question uh, along the, like, uh, so it's asking uh, about like where our community is along the path to creating AI ready data. Other communities think, think of things like data quality, like consistency, lack of systematic bias, error bars, access, documentation, and uh, persistent identifiers appropriate. Are we working towards that or do we need a frame that is broader than addressing one set of data or one type of materials or type of property? And I want to add like, like how can we, I think one of the things that was discussed yesterday uh, was incentives, giving incentives for people to make their data readily available for AI. Uh, like a, because it can add a lot of extra work for for people instead of working their next research, uh, putting them in a like a database or making available for public can be extra. Uh, may need extra incentives. Like what what could be as well. So I will just uh, if you can, maybe Maria, you want to go first. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a small thing, but I started putting. Um... And, you know, people have their websites, they would put, you know, um, their, their background, they would put publications, they would put their research areas and so on. But I just started putting um, data sets, um, you know, as part of the website. And I think people should do that, like for their CVs and um, and encourage their postdocs and students to do that. Um, it's, it's a small thing, but I think um, part of it is, I have argued with our um, management, um, who who has like a performance uh, evaluation metric that counts sort of a lot of things 
but strangely does not count, you know, data because it's new. Um, so um, I've argued with them that they should count, you know, data sets made public as, as a, you know, part of a performance. Um, and, and so like it's in small ways like that, I think we should start to like legitimize um, having made data available as, as a, um, as as a performance metric, as a as a contribution, as a product, you know, um, in at all levels, um, and of course, you know, when some of us get into like more influential management roles, then maybe we can make a bigger impact on them. Um, but I think as you start to think that way, I think you can try to influence um, the decision making. Uh, but of course, on the you know top level. Um, when funding agencies uh, look at project success, um, it, it needs to be considered that, you know, whether data is a product, I think uh, Jim Warren mentioned yesterday, if your data is not there, your work is wasted. Um, I think that need, that mentality needs to be, make its way into funding agencies um, and program managers as well. Yeah, definitely, I think. Thanks, Faye. I, I think this cannot be only a, a bottom up, uh, a grassroots uh, effort. It has to have resource from top down. I always look at uh, a flow, uh, matures project as the perfect example. Their data are widely used, easily accessible, the same format. People are using them like uh, crazy because they're easy to use. They're publicly available. They can mass download. Uh, I think for every materials domain, the, there has to be uh, there needs to be a, a materials project uh, uh, database, uh, either from uh, computation or maybe in the future there is autonomous uh, experiments and then keep generating data twenty four seven. Um, then it comes to uh, the resource. It has to be. I, I don't think academia is very good at this because uh, professors' uh, research uh, interest. Uh, moves every uh, so many years, um, and then uh, you end up with database uh, or, uh, lack of uh, refreshments uh, or uh, lack of, uh, say, uh, maintenance. Um, I think national labs uh, would have more continuity. Um, um, DOE or uh, other funding agencies uh, should put a lot of money to sustain this, uh, have dedicated people. Uh, uh, to sustain uh, the, the 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 databases, uh, so that is up to date. That's my take. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, Mohammed. Yeah, I just want to yeah plus one to what Tang Shai you said, but like I want to go a step further and and yeah. A materials project for every domain is amazing. Like that, that striving for that is great. I think one other thing that we've started to think about, and like, um, I mean, there's lots of data sources out there. And like, we we've seen, I don't know, people have probably seen like the Mace FM work, for instance, of like foundation models of how do you combine data sets and how do you train across different domains, um, and that's something like. How do we create a materials project for all of atomistic modeling, for instance, not just like specific polymers or specific material? Like um, one of the challenges are just, and this is more of just a, like implementation of like, how do we actually take this data and train these large graph neural networks, for instance? Um, you have different metadata from one database, you have different file formats from one database, um, and it does become burdensome to like, okay, look at this data set, um, see what available data is, how do you actually construct your, a actual AI ready data for these ML models, like to ready to train for ML. Um, and that is very inconsistent across these different domains and centralizing all those efforts such that if I were to query this one centralized, I don't know, chemistry database, um, I can pull something that like a bulk crystal from materials project, but I can also pull a polymer and they both have like the necessary information or the bare minimum, like of course different domains have different metadata, but like at the very least, like atomic coordinates, atomic um, identities, that is sufficient for training these large um, graph neural networks. I um, mean, centralizing those efforts is really what I think of AI ready data in the sense of what is the minimal barrier to taking a data set and actually training these ML models. Um, and 
as more and more repositories come up in more and more formats, um, that barrier gets larger and larger um, from a researcher perspective. Thank you. All about. Oops. Yeah, to just piggyback off of what Maria said, you know, I think a lot of the change needs to come from the top because scientists will do what they're funded to do. And I think right now, data is treated a little bit like safety, where, yes, you want safety to be a part of every project, but you're not going to fund a project that's dedicated to safety. And, um, you know, data is treated the same way. Yes, every, every program manager wants data to be a part of their project, but they don't, that's not the focus of, of the project. The focus is new materials or the focus is whatever, new theory, what else. Uh, and so I think there needs to be some kind of understanding that data can be something that is uh, an end to itself. And if the funding is there, I think scientists uh, will work on it. Now, one positive development is I think the, uh, the journal scientific data and other similar data centric papers, as well as like open source software uh, journals and things like that. That has been a way that we can generate data sets or a student uh, can spend a lot of time generating or compiling a data set and then publish a paper about that data that lets them collect citations and also is an established metric for success of a project. Like, okay, we published a paper and we've had certainly data papers that have had, you know, lots of citations that have helped uh, launch the careers of, of, of people in the group. So I think that some things like that are helpful. Um, there's still definitely challenges. I mean, one of the big challenges that we see is that data sets tend to be living. And uh, the people that contribute at the time of submitting a paper are not necessarily the people that are contributing to that data 10 years later. But the citations are always coming to the people that did it at a, a magic point in time. <laughs> but, um, and so how do you continue to give credit to the people that you know come in and clean up a data set later or come in and contribute additional data sets? There's no real mechanism um, for doing that. Uh, other issues I would say, one of them is a lot of scientific analysis is done by kind of cleaning things up. Uh, you, you collect a data set, it's messy, and you clean it up for the, the, the data that you care about. And when you have large data sets, it's very hard to clean up like 10,000 data points. So you collected 10,000 spectra, and there's definitely things wrong in some of those spectra or some of the, the, the characterization that was done. Like, how do you clean that up in a way? And you can clean up the two or three that you're focusing on for a paper, but you can't like examine all 10,000. So I think that that is one of the big issues that also remains uh, unsolved. And then finally, you know, in terms of these large data sets, I think one of the things that we've been lucky with with simulations is that it's very easy to describe the simulation input. So we have a crystal structure and that is the input. And then given that crystal structure here, are all the properties that we calculate. With experimental data, it becomes very complicated because yes, you measure the spectra of something, but that something is often labeled like MOF 75. And what is MOF 75? Well, it's like some crazy crystal structure with some microstructure and some interfaces, et cetera, in it. And so even if you know that like MOF 75 had the spectra, you can't really do anything with it unless you know everything about MOF 75. And so having good ways to connect this characterization data with as much as we know about the material and try to standardize that is going to be necessary, I think, to like make the next push into machine learning for experimental data as well. So certainly a lot of things to work on, um, but yeah, I think we're making some progress at least. Yeah, I, I really agree with the last point Anibar was saying that we have project, uh, we have a project on uh, spectroscopy data, for example, um, and you know, for for those of us who simulate uh, spectra, it's it's straightforward. Like Anibar said, you have a structure, then you get a spectrum. But for all the experimental data, um, um, not all of them have a single structure. Um, sometimes it's a composite. Um, then you you have the issue of you know trying to label it to what it is. Um, most of them have no known uh, structure. There's a, the biggest X-ray uh, absorption spectrum database um, comes from uh, Matt Newview from U Chicago, um, and it has um, you know uh, samples that are labeled steel and so on, just like Anubov's example. Um, so, but we we have to work together, right? Um, so we actually in the um, this project. Uh, called MDB, um, AI multimodal data. Um, uh, we, we actually try to work out a schema that will uh, accommodate both experimental data with no known structure, 
um, and also simulated data with a, a single identify structure. And we need to think about that in terms of you know database architecture um, and and uh, user sort of needs. Um, and it is in these type of hybrid sort of no man's land type data that um, that that we need to really you know work out uh, and work together. Um, I, I think this panel illustrate one of the issues is that um, you know all of us are computational people and. Um, <laughs> and, and getting the experimental uh, perspective is actually really uh, crucial, but there's different cultures, different, um, you know, starting points. Um, so I think that's where we're going to try to make progress is to bring all the other uh, people on the table and work out compromise, things that aren't great uh, from a computational point of view, but it's sort of workable uh, from, from all, all points. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Maria. Thanks for all uh, for the insights. I think so. One of the comments came uh, about the top-down approach, like you. I think both Tang Fei and well, Maria, you all said that this has this come. But what is when? What do you mean with top-down? Do you mean the so grant agencies or the department heads, uh, pro program managers? Uh, but can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, from a policy level, you know, starting from uh, government agencies, um, program managers, and and I mean, um, the uh, Nelson Memorandum came from OSTP, so um, it's it's a top down right um, sort of mandate. Um, but the like Tang Fei Nanobab mentioned, you know, the funding also needs to. Um, um, come from the top down, um, you know, th when there's a mandate, there should be resources that come with it um, that uh, allows this, this uh, to be fulfilled. I think um, it, it gets overwhelming if there are no resources and people have to, you know, do more things. Um, and also most of the time without getting due credit, um, you know, you don't get a, a permanent position from having been an excellent, um, you know, um, um, data person most of the time. Um, so I, I think that whole, but, you know, tenure position and, and permanent position also is driven by funding, right? So I think um, that gets down to the, the bottom line, really, that um, we need to um, legitimize and recognize the work, the importance of, of data, AI-ready data, um, not just the newest, fanciest model, um, that um, allows people to to you know pursue this work on this. Um, you know, one thing that is is the question is like where where does industry come in? Um, in some of the fields I work in, um, industrial R and D dwarfs um, uh, government funding. Um, so, um, is you know if does industry see value in the data that's generated outside, and how can we actually uh, leverage that? Um, I think that's that's something that we need to think about. I think it should be. So sorry. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Uh, I I I think it should be funding agency, multiple funding agency funding different areas like the manufacturing uh, centers we have. Um, the uh, Obama uh, administration gave these close to a uh, hundred million dollar uh, centers. There are, there are many of them. Can the agency fund maybe a smaller scale um, uh, database centers uh, for different domains? Um, and then they're funded for like five years. And then after that, uh, they're supposed to be self-sustained. Um, but I, I do think uh, the sustainability, uh, it's uh, for some centers has been questionable. Um, I still prefer the, the centers to be hosted in national labs because they turn to uh, uh, have more stable people and then uh, have uh, uh, more stable funding than academia. Um, that's that's my thinking. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, you know, if you're someone that wants to have a faculty application and 
faculty application A is you want to understand the fundamentals of transport and nanomaterials. And uh, faculty application B is that you want to create a database of all the spectra of materials uh, and make that accessible for you know, researchers worldwide. Um, I think fac today the situation is that faculty application A is going to be the more, you know, more uh, successful one. And faculty application B, they're going to say, well, what is the actual science you're going to do with those spectra? And, you know, you can't just create a database as, as your, as your, you know, um, yeah, as your job. So I, I think right now, again, it's data is seen as a side thing, which is, uh, you know, it's the part of projects, but it's not the focus of a project. And I, you know, there needs to be more of a mentality shift that data can be the project itself. And it can be a very important uh, thing that a lot of people in the community end up using and it has lots of impact. You know, the same way that, you know, a light source uh, is a tool that a lot of people will use in order to make advances in their research. You know, a big database can be like a light source in terms of accelerating research and lots of things. So, uh, you know, people understand the value of a light source, but I don't think they're quite getting this like database stuff yet. So um, yeah, I, I think that kind of shift maybe needs to happen. And I think it's happening, it's happening slowly, but yeah, the faster would be better is, is all I would say. Okay, yeah, thank you. I think we are coming to an end. I just wanna mention one before ending, I think. Um, uh, Let's, yeah, I think we are we are over time. Uh, the poster session is going to start, but thank you. Before ending, thank you all, uh, all the panelists and Kamal. Uh, thanks for all the comments and also the people who are uh, actively participating in the discussion.